at Georgia Tech. And on behalf of our search committee and our committee co-chair, Susan Margulies, who's right there. <laughs> um, I am pleased to introduce uh, Professor M.G. Finn at this morning's town hall presentation. M.G. is a candidate for the executive director position in the Petit Institute for Bioengineering and Biosciences. Uh, M.G. is over there. M.G. is currently uh, the chair of chemistry and biochemistry here uh, at Georgia Tech also. Um, so he's a chemist. And despite his chosen format for the presentation today, he has a foundational history at institutes of technology. <laughs> his bachelor's degree uh, is from Caltech. His PhD is from MIT and he uh, conducted postdoctoral research at Stanford. After faculty positions at the University of Virginia and Scripps in San Diego, uh, MG came to Georgia Tech in 2013. Since 2014, he has been chair of chemistry and biochemistry, and since 2016, he has been the chief scientific officer of the Georgia Tech Pediatric Technology Center. As many of you know, MG has been a strong advocate for core facilities and a leader uh, in uh, the programming of the EBB1 building. In fact, I first learned about MG before he came to Georgia Tech uh, as he was marshalling plans for core facilities and heavily involved in EBB1 programming at that time. Broadly speaking, MG does research in the area of chemical biology and the evolution of viruses. Um, for those of you that like statistics, his H index is 80, and his publications have been cited over 34,000 times. Um, let me just say a few things about this town hall format. We will give MG um, about 40 minutes to talk to us, maybe a little bit longer, about his vision uh, for IBB, um, and then uh, we'll open up to questions. So please join me in welcoming uh, MG. Thank you very much, Todd. I assume everybody can hear me. Um, and I'm very grateful to you, Dr. Streelman, uh, and to the rest of the uh, committee for giving me this opportunity. It really is quite an honor. Um, and since this is not a science talk, uh, I decided to give a chalk talk um, because I want to focus on, on uh, just the ideas uh, and some, some key, perhaps core philosophies maybe, and uh, start a conversation. So you're not, we're not going to see any data here. Uh, I'll make only glancing reference to what uh, my group actually does, but thanks group members for coming. Uh, there's my people over here, thank you. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll get into it. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I often say, and it's true, that I, with apologies to my wonderful colleagues in chemistry, uh, IBB is the reason I came to Georgia Tech five years ago uh, from Scripps, um, where uh, Scripps was and is a, a wonderful place, but really had very little uh, in the way of shared vision and shared facilities and shared mission other than their graduate program, which I was privileged to be part of for many years. Um, but when I uh, came to Georgia Tech for the first time uh, after the uh, IRIs were established and got uh, to know the IBB system, I was really quite blown away. Um, this, as I will allude to later, is uh, really a unique uh, institution, uh, a unique uh, organization within the institution in the country. Uh, and uh, so that's why I'm here and that's why I'd be excited to, to help uh, lead the, uh, the next era of IBB. Um, this was the charge for this workshop, for this, uh, this uh, uh, talk. So um, three things, your background as it relates to interdisciplinary work, vision for interdisciplinary scholarship and leadership, and plans. And so Todd did a nice job uh, and uh, went through some of my background, so I don't have to do some of that. Um, but uh, here's, here's, a, here's a quote. Um, Seymour Benzer, uh, for those of you who don't know, was the person that introduced Drosophila genetics uh, to the world and really uh, brought a modern understanding, started the modern understanding of genes and how genes work. Um, and as a hero of mine, as is he is, I'm sure, of many of you, a uh, wonderful biography of him, by the way, called Time, Love, Memory. Uh, if you get nothing else out of this talk, 
go pick up a copy and, and read it. It's a delightful book. Um, this is actually not from that book, but Benzer uh, wrote or, or, or in an interview um, uh, said this, it's always very refreshing to be able to just make a clean break, start over again about something you're completely ignorant about. It's exhilarating, nothing is expected because you're a novice, and with luck you come up with something that other people were saying was impossible because they know too much, so being ignorant has a certain advantage. And this is uh, certainly my background. Um, and it's a, it's a stance, it's a, uh, a strategy that I've used several times in my career uh, with great delight. Um, uh, and uh, so I'll just tell you a little bit. So Todd went through the, the, the bare bones. I'll start the story then at uh, UVA. Um, God, I hate talking about myself, but this is, uh, this is important to understand where I come from, perhaps. So at UVA, I spent the nine years there starting my academic career doing uh, transition metal organometallic chemistry. So developing new chemical reactions, uh, trying to figure out how good chemical reactions worked, so doing mechanistic work. You know, good solid chemistry, and I uh, was fortunate enough to be promoted in, the, in due course, the normal time frame. Uh, but when I was putting that tenure package together, um, I actually had a sort of an epiphany, which was really almost waking up one morning thinking, you know, 20 or 30 years from now, maybe 20 or 30 people are going to care about what we're doing. Um, and now it's 20 or 30 years on, and less than 20 or 30 people care about what we did back then, I suspect. Um, uh, now, I was, you know, we were doing good chemistry, uh, and, and I would have been very happy doing good chemistry, but it really wouldn't have had an impact. Um, and uh, so I decided, let's, let's make a change, and I started to get into the field of combinatorial development of catalysts. So we were studying catalysts. This was a new concept, make many, many variations on a theme, and, and uh, instead of having the making be the hard part, have the selecting be the hard part. Pick out the catalysts that work best. This is actually more difficult than it sounds, because catalysts don't grab onto things. It's easy to make a binder that's something that binds better than something else, but it's actually relatively difficult to make a catalyst. Um, and so we got into that a little bit. Um, and then uh, I had the opportunity to uh, take a sabbatical, and I managed to wangle a spot at the Scripps Research Institute. Um, this was Richard Lerner, was the, was the president, gave a talk that I happened to hear, and I ran to him at the end, and I said, hey, I have a sabbatical coming. I want to learn something about molecular biology. Can I come and spend it at your place? And he, we arranged it, and I spent nearly a year. Uh, and the interesting thing about this experience was that I really didn't know anything about molecular biology. This was now in 1996 or so. Molecular biology was certainly uh, you know, coming to the fore, and I knew I was missing something. I had no idea what it was. I'd never taken a class. I didn't know the first thing about the jargon or the concepts. Um, and I really had no idea what it was good for, but I figured, what's what a sabbatical's for? Let's be ignorant. Uh, and, and, and go. So I spent a wonderful year in the laboratory of Carlos Barbas, who sadly passed away a few years ago, uh, and Richard Lerner, and I did uh, catalytic antibody work. It was the first time I had handled a protein, like in the laboratory, um, which for a small molecule chemist was a big deal. First time I'd handled DNA, run a gel, anything like that. Um, but the most important part of that experience was I actually would take a postdoc, I'd pick a different victim every two or three weeks, Take a postdoc to lunch, and I'd say, uh, the, the deal is this. I'll buy you lunch, but uh, we don't get up from the table until I understand this paper. It happened to be a, a paper I was trying to, to read. And keep in mind, I didn't know anything. I had no idea what the jargon was, what the underlying concepts underneath the jargon were. Right. So some of these lunches lasted a really long time, <laughs> okay? because that was the deal. I need to understand this paper before I get up. Uh, and after a year of that, I felt confident enough uh, to be able to read in molecular biology and cell biology and associated fields and at least begin to understand what the problems were. I'm still a chemist. I went back to UVA uh, and was trying to figure out a way to integrate this new knowledge into what we were doing. And Scripps called me about a year later and offered me a job. So I went there in 1998. Um, and that really changed my life. And, and my experience at Scripps is what informs uh, my value and love of interdisciplinary science, uh, interdisciplinary research in, in the life sciences. And um, so, uh, let's see, no, I won't go on quite yet. Okay, um, so let me tell you a quick script story. Um, so we started then doing 
uh, chemistry at Scripps, um, and through an encounter mediated by a mutual friend, actually the mass spectrometrist, I uh, had a meeting with a structural biologist there named Jack Johnson, who at the time owned about half of the crystal structures ever done on viruses. And I thought these were the most amazingly beautiful structures I had ever seen. Chemists love structure. Uh, and so I immediately proposed to Jack to start collaborating. So this was a meeting that I hadn't looked for that was en enabled because of the environment. Um, and a little bit of money was there. I had some unrestricted money uh, from my startup package at Scripps. So let's start doing stuff. And we started collaborating. Jack's people taught my people how to do cloning, how to do protein expression. We started making things. And we essentially created the field of using viruses as molecules. So making designed connections to virus particles with chemical techniques, with organic chemistry, marry them with these biological structures that are genetically tailorable. So we had the ability to code function in both genetically and chemically and create things that we would hope would have some function. And that was the first time anybody had done that. Um, and we got a lot of press and it was a lot of fun. We got a lot of papers. Uh, and after two or three years, the funding agencies started to ask, what's it good for? Right? So the gee whiz factor lasted about two, two, three years. And then we had to figure out what it was good for. And we started to do that. So uh, viruses are interesting because they have large surfaces, and so they bind things in multiple points. And so we started to get interested in the concept of polyvalency, which is multiple point attachment. That led us to the field of glycobiology, because the interactions of carbohydrates in biology are very uh, often multi-point attachments. And there's a lot of information coded in there. So we could contribute to that field by making platforms and structures that others could use or we could use to test hypotheses. And then we got into immunology, because viruses are naturally immunogenic. Um, and we started to do immunology. And this was all in the context of Scripps, which had these wonderfully biologically oriented scientists there. No engineers, but, but fundamental scientists. Um, and we were then able to begin to do these things across disciplines. And that was huge fun. The other thing that happened at Scripps early on was I got reconnected with my old PhD advisor, Barry Sharpless, um, who, was at, who was there. And we started to hatch, really Barry's inspiration, to, to hatch a philosophy uh, that became known as click chemistry, which is essentially the development and use of very powerful, highly reliable organic chemistry reactions to make connections between things. Simple idea. Of course, chemists always look for good reactions. But what Barry's challenge to the community was, the organic chemistry community primarily, was can you use these reactions and only these reactions to build things? And so building becomes easy. And now the challenge is, is it useful, right? The question we were getting about viruses was the question we wanted to enable others to, ch to, to tackle using easy chemical reactions to build stuff. And so this would open up the world of chemical synthesis to those who weren't skilled in the art. Okay? And so click chemistry, we wrote a paper um, which we affectionately called the manifesto, uh, which was an interesting hybrid of a review and a, and a, uh, and a primary paper. And that kicked off the field. And, and my lab started doing research in this area. And we focused on developing reactions to make bonds to biological molecules, because we were working with virus particles. So it all fit together in an odd way to create a program wherein we were interacting with all sorts of people uh, and all over scripts. Uh, being chemical support or co-investigators in a wide variety of, of, of areas. And that showed me the power of interdisciplinary research. Um, and it really was a rather unusual thing at Scripps to have so many of these connections. But it was easy at Scripps because there were lots of people who had biology utility in mind and were looking for chemistry to help them out. Okay, so that's where that comes from. That's where I come from, uh, from an intellectual, uh, scientific point of view. So during this time, um, I took over the Journal of Combinatorial Chemistry in 2010. That stemmed from our interest in combinatorial catalysis, and I had a, uh, some name recognition in that field. And we changed the journal. We, we turned it from a, com from a chemistry journal to a science journal, and it's now called, the, the AC it's now called ACS Combinatorial Science. So that journal published chemistry, but also biology, material science, ana an, uh, anal analytics and, and uh, analytical methods, theory, um, all wrapped around the 
the subject of combinatorial, multiple attempt, high throughput kinds of ways to achieve function, okay? An interdisciplinary goal if I ever heard one, right? Um, it is the only ACS journal, American Chemical Society journal, and one of the few journals in the world that's devoted to a method, right? We publish combinatorial science applied to all sorts of things. Um, and again, a very interesting way and a very enriching way to look at the world. Um, Scripps has, uh, at that time, had a relationship with a succeeding succession of, of big pharma companies uh, for right of first refusal of intellectual property. And at most of my period there, that was Pfizer. And so Pfizer would send people to campus looking for folks to collaborate with, and my lab was fortunate enough to attract their attention. So we've been working with Pfizer for more than 10 years. They've continually funded postdocs in my lab for that time. We now are funded by Merck, um, and I have uh, strong either advisory roles or, or consulting roles with a number of biotech companies. So while at Scripps, I got connected with uh, chemical industry, or at least pharma, pharma and biotech. So I have some uh, uh, familiarity with what they're looking for and, 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 and how they like to operate. Um, and then I moved to, to techs, as Todd told you. Um, EBB was a joy. Programming, if you really want to learn about your new colleagues, right, discuss space with them before they know you. <laughs> it gave me a wonderful window into the really remarkably collegial environment that is here, and I treasure that. I will tell one story, and then I'll move on to other things. This is a story about the Molecular Evolution Core Facility, which we have now. Um, so we were talking about cores, uh, and you know, some of them were pretty easy, right? We, we need more power in you know, more users. We have too many users we can handle in microscopy or cytometry or whatever, mass spectrometry we needed to build up. All of that, the administration is incredible, uh, has been incredibly responsive. Um, and then I had this idea, uh, thinking that there are a lot of people here who need biological molecules to do something, typically bind to something, maybe something else. Um, and the way to make those is to evolve them. And there are standard techniques to do that. But those techniques are a little bit higher bar in terms of familiarity and, and sophistication than most labs would have a chance to do on their own. So I thought this was a nice opportunity for a core in this technique, or this set of techniques, much like the journal that I mentioned is a set of techniques. I've envisioned this core as a place where you could send your student to learn how to do phage display or, or, or CLEX or a variety of, of standard techniques. And so I pitched this idea for a molecular evolution core. There is no such core anywhere else in the country. And the administration asked me the question that I came to recognize very quickly as the classic Georgia Tech question, which is, who would this benefit? Okay, and that was a terrific question. I spent two weeks sending emails around. I got 50 emails saying, this is a great idea. I would use it. Here's how I would use it. I bundled them. I gave it to the administration. And they said, yes, we'll do it. Uh, and then two years, three years later, the core has been established. Uh, Anton Brixen runs it, uh, and he's doing an amazing job. And it's gone in directions that I had not envisioned. Um, but that was my most essential lesson in how receptive Georgia Tech and IBB is to new technology and enabling people to connect. And so I'm really proud of that, and I'm proud of IBB for it. I'm very grateful um, for, for that. Just lastly, um, the, the PTC role, I won't talk much about. Pediatric Technology Center. Um, I got into that via the Center for Pediatric Nanomedicine, which I took over when Gang Val left. Again, that was because of our nanoparticle work. Sherry Ferrugia is back there, Leanne West. I work with these folks, Aaron and Christopher, all the time. Um, and we are here to help Georgia Tech connect to Children's Healthcare of Atlanta and to other pediatric um, providers and, uh, and researchers uh, around the country. And, and I'm, that's, a, that's a, a joy to do that. Um, I've been involved in the immunoengineering initiative uh, and on that steering committee. Immunology was a really important thing for me here, and I was super happy to know that uh, it is supported uh, and our immunoengineering uh, training grant, congrats to Julie Babensey, is, is terrific. Um, and uh, the school chair role. So that's the, the fingers and most of the pies uh, that I have uh, uh, currently. Um, I just wanted to show you... One last thing. This is a list of our current collaborators, and I suspect it's not quite complete. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 ju I just throw this up here just to show you that my lab really lives this thing, okay, this thing of interdisciplinary science. We do all of this stuff because we're good at some things that these collaborators value, um, and we use these collaborations not just make something and send it off, although that sometimes happens, but 
make something, send it off, learn more, exchange people, and really make it collaborative. And, and to me, that's one of the most important training opportunities that my students can have access to. Uh, and uh, it's a wide variety of kinds of, of, of things we're involved in. Um, and this is what, what gets me out of bed. Um, OK. So the next thing I'm supposed to talk about is um, interdisciplinary scholarship and leadership. Um, so here's another one. This is from Bob Langer, who many of you know. Um, when you're a student, <clears throat> you're judged by how well you answer questions. But in life, you're judged by how good your questions are. You want students and postdocs to transition from giving good answers to asking good questions. Then they'll become great professors, entrepreneurs, great something if they ask good questions. So this is, of course, one of the premier bioengineers. Um, and uh, this is the essence of what in my mind, an interdisciplinary environment enables, right? We all get trained in something as PhD students. Um, we're all very happy in that, in that thing, right? We know it. It's, you know, the 10,000 hours, right? When you master something by spending a certain amount of time at it, it's in your bones. You don't get funded to do that anymore, right? There are very few careers in the life sciences where you can stay in one place that you did as a graduate student and have a well-funded career. That just doesn't happen. So you have to learn how to ask good questions. And the only way you do that, you can ask bad questions really easily. Okay? But to ask good questions, you need an environment of people around you that you can test those ideas against and the facilities in w to which you can ask scientific questions by doing experiments quickly, inexpensively, easily. And that's how you get to this state. Um, and so that's one of the guiding principles um, that, uh, or, or goals, if you will, that I have when we're talking about interdisciplinary scholarship and leadership. But let me give you, I have noted down here, five core principles. Okay? So the first one is science versus, and pardon me for my, my uh, terrible uh, penmanship. Uh, I'm not nervous this is the way I normally write. Okay? <laughs> so science versus engineering. I do want to say a little bit about this. Okay? There is, of course, a natural distinction between the training that students get as engineers and the training that students get as scientists. Um, and one can, can oversimplify this very easily, but it really is different, uh, both in aspects perhaps of quantitation, paying attention to models and, 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 and mathematical or computational treatments, which engineers tend to do more of, perhaps, but also in, in sociology, right? Scientists still aren't well educated, by and large, at the early age in collaboration. Engineers, you work in groups, engineers work in groups from day one, right? So there are real differences in culture and education. But in reality, if you are a functioning, biological-oriented scientist and you're getting funding, you are neither scientist nor engineer or you are both. I don't care what department you're in, at Georgia Tech or anywhere else. If you're in an engineering department, you still have to know and do good science to get funded. If you're a scientist, you still have to have applications in mind or, or in progress. Um, to get funded, and so you're doing engineering in some sense as well. At Georgia Tech, it doesn't matter. Okay? And so as IBB director, I will never think, I don't think in these terms, are you a scientist or an engineer? That just doesn't enter into my thinking. It's what are you doing? And who can you do it with? Um, and and that's, that's all I will pay attention to. Um, number two. is a warning that I constantly remind myself. No dilettantism. The danger in, in interdisciplinary science, particularly for an individual laboratory, but it can extend to departments as well, and perhaps larger, is you have a tendency to pat yourself on the back by going out of your comfort zone. Um, and the real danger there is you really don't know what you're talking about. And I have done this many times. Um, uh, you know, in a meeting, spouting off something I thought I just knew, I learned, whatever, and to be gently or not so gently reminded that I really don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and so as IBB director, it's not my role to mentor every student in, in, in the institute, but it is my role, or it would be uh, an important role of any experienced interdisciplinary scientist here, um, to make sure that our younger colleagues, or even ourselves, or even our older colleagues, um, are guarding against this. Okay, because this doesn't get you funded. Um, and, and it pops up everywhere uh, more, than, more than you like. Um, 
The third guiding principle is follow the money, but also make the money follow you. Um, and here's an example of this. So following the money is obvious. We need to pay attention to program announcements at the NIH and the DOD and everywhere else to know what those agencies are interested in. IBB can help with that. And IBB, I think, should probably, if we can get the staffing, do more of that to alert faculty and Georgia Tech in the life area more to what's available and to help bring people together. So a little bit of funding for seed grants. I'm a huge fan of seed grants. That's all we do in the PTC. And it's, a, it's incredibly enabling. I'm a great fan of a little bit of money to bring people together, the Blue Sky program that the EVPR does. We need to do more of that within IBB. We need to get people talking in any number of ways, events, mixers, small and large, okay, get people together. Um, so that's a, the way you effectively follow the money. The way you, you, you make the money follow you is in a number of ways that I think are important. First is a great example is uh, CMAT, cell manufacturing, right? A huge success here. And that large, large grant, that whole area, I don't think was on the radar screen of the NSF until Chris Roy and others put it there, right? This is something we know the community is going to need. You haven't been thinking about it, but it's really important. And that case was made, okay? A shining example. And IBB had a huge role in that, right? So tip of the hat to everybody in that and who's currently running it. Another example, however, is on a smaller scale. We should be, IBB should be engaging, in my view, in bringing those people who set those agendas to campus. As I say often, the reaction I most get when I bring colleagues from institutions all over the country here to visit, the reaction I get is, I had no idea this was here. I had no idea this community of XYZ, biomaterials people, or immunologists, or whatever, or these facilities. So you got Georgia Tech is doing biology, right? You know, or you know, bio of course Georgia Tech is doing bioengineering. Right? It's number two rated department in the country, but people still haven't internalized it. They think of other parts of the country first. So the only way we're going to change that is to bring them here. And IBB, I think, can do that, can, can help the money follow us by bringing both academic leaders and, to the extent we can do so, program officers, uh, and, and industry leaders to campus uh, in ways that will allow them to, to uh, engage with us in a, in a real manner. Um, okay, number four, in terms of principles for interdisciplinary scholarship and leadership is an easy one, right? Connections. So I told you about my experience at Scripps where we got into viruses because of a chance connection, right? That, of course, all of us who do interdisciplinary work know that this is true. IBB does a great job at this. We just need to keep doing it. We need to, IBB is the entity that crosses schools and colleges for the life sciences and engineering. We sh that's, that's the business that, that, that this organization should be in and, and we will continue to do that. Um, and again, that's a little bit, it goes a long way in, in helping see those connections. Um, and this is one that will pop up. So you can't swing a cat in an NIH study section or in a meeting of any society dealing with molecules or living things without hitting the word interdisciplinary, right? Everybody is interdisciplinary. Every program you look up on the net, on the web, every institution claims they're interdisciplinary because they have to be, right? That's the way you get money. That's the way you get funded. The devil, of course, is in the details in how you do it and how well you do it. And I am here to tell you that IBB is unique, almost uniquely effective, in my experience, in the country. Our competitors, I think, in terms of an organization that combines facilities, staff, moderate cost, right, and general effectiveness, all of those things taken together, in my experience, there are only maybe three or four places that, that approach IBB's uh, level of, of impact. And one is at Stanford. Completely different kettle of fish there in terms of the resources they have. Um, another is at Univers University of Chicago, and the Chicago area has done a very nice job in assembling an interdisciplinary life science support system there. Um, again, a private institution. I think the resources there are a little different. And you see Berkeley Lawrence, Berkeley Labs, and the Molecular Foundry, right? Totally different level of funding there as well. But again, they have a very nice set of facilities and people to help connect. But IBB in many ways, in the detail ways, does it better. Um, and so my, my message here is only working your ass off actually helps. 
okay? And we do that, and I would certainly do that um, uh, to do what we do and just, just keep doing it very well. Okay. Uh, so, next two topics, next topic, plans for the Petit Institute. Oh my goodness, what did I do? Uh, let's move these down here. Okay, there we go. I teach in this room, but I still don't know the, uh, uh, the, uh, the AV stuff. Okay, so here's Sidney Brenner again. Um, progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries. Oh, sorry, this is uh, not Benzer, this is Brenner. I forgot to introduce Brenner. Um, C. elegans, right? So Brenner is uh, among those who popularized the use of C. elegans as, a, as an organism and did all sorts of stuff. I had a chance to meet Sidney years ago. Interesting guy. Um, progress depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas probably in that order. Okay, an interesting statement from somebody regarded as among the most creative biologists uh, in the last hundred years. Um, but in my view, he's absolutely right. It's this idea of you want to be ignorant, you want to ask questions, new questions that people haven't asked before. To properly, non-dilettantily ask those questions, you really need techniques, you need infrastructure, uh, to drive those, to drive those asking of those questions. So this is meant to call attention to the real business of IBB, which is to provide technological resources as well as resources in in marketing and communications um, to us as, as the Georgia Tech community. Uh, and then, of course, Benzer again in the second one. Uh, this is an interview that's published. Really excellent reading. Um, do you see a solution for some of these problems? Talking about funding, uh, it's in every area of science about the money, and Benzer, of course, has more money. Right? Um, and, and that will be a theme um, that, uh, in terms of my plans for the Petit Institute, um, will focus a lot, of course, on, on the resources. So the issues then are, in perhaps rough order of importance, is financial sustainability. So this is a partnership. Um, with the institute administration. Everybody's on the same team here. Uh, we tend to kind of yell at Steve Cross sometimes, you know, why don't you give me more money or me more money, and I have incredible sympathy for what Steve has to deal with every day. Um, we're all on the same team. I am very confident that the president on down values IBB, um, and there is a case continued to, needs to be made, however, for levels of support from the institute that will allow IBB to continue on its trajectory. We are at a, essentially a tipping point here. Um, the Institute invested heavily in core facilities and staff when EBB opened up. Probably 70% increase in the amount of core facility operations or something like that, um, all under the IBB umbrella. The IBB budget was not increased by that amount. There was money put in for the salary lines and there was money put in uh, for that one-time equipment. But the sustaining costs are now coming due, right? Um, uh, uh, service contracts, upgrades, continued support of staff, expanding staff as these cores usage expands. So there is a sustainability issue. Um, and that is something that I would work very intensively with the administration. Let's get as much from the administration as possible because every dollar that the administration invests in IBB is repaid many, many fold. And I think we can document that the current, you know, Bob Goldberg and others have documented this in many ways. We need to continue to do that. It is an investment Georgia Tech cannot afford not to make. And I would have very pointed discussions with the administration on this subject. There are also other potential revenue streams which are beginning to come uh, to fruition through Steve Woodard's and others' uh, really hard work. So a memorandum of understanding has been has been achieved now with other Georgia universities, institutions, so that we can go there and get access to their facilities at their internal rates. They can come here and get access to our facilities at our internal rates. And that's starting to bring in significant amount of new users, significant revenue to the cores in IBB. It, playing with industry is another source, I think, poorly tapped source of potential revenue. There are hurdles to overcome there to make our facilities more welcoming to industry in a responsible manner but I'm convinced we can do that. So the first and most important goal uh, in terms of planning for IBB will to be come up with a sustainable uh, platform, a sustainable um, a funding model so that we can continue to grow when we need to grow and rearrange when we need to rearrange. So I'll just lay out my initial, public, very publicly, my initial proposal to the administration would be 
essentially, let's establish a realistic number percentage of cost recovery that the IBB cores, talking about core funding now, not administrative funding, cores have to recover um, to be sustainable. And I'll throw, a num I'll throw out a number of 50%. Okay? So if, if the IBB cores recover 50% of their costs through user fees, and those costs include salary lines, to me, that is a huge win. Right? There is no other facility that I'm aware of in the country that, that recovers sustained costs at that level with a fair funding model, while keeping costs to the investigators moderate, okay, reasonable. And if we recover 55%, I will argue that is not a reason to cut administration support. It is a reason to reinvest. It is a reason, it is evidence that we are achieving a level of usage and support of the community that exceeds an already outstanding level. So something good's happening here. Let's keep going. Let's reinvest. Okay? The other part of the sustainable model is the Petit Institute endowment, which is another subject for, for discussion. Um, OK, uh, another issue is staffing. So and I'll first talk about the scientists, scientific and engineering staffing, which means the staff of the core facilities that IBB manages. These are amazing people, um, and they need to be engaged in two ways. I think they have a dual mission. Their primary mission is service, right? As an investigator, we rely on IBB staff to help us with all sorts of things, right? And that is a mission, obviously, that they've signed on for. They need to be evaluated and rewarded on that basis. But to get the best people to help you get the best science done, there also has to be a creative component, if they want that component. There has to be space. And, and evident, and, and their mission has to be well-defined so that they have some time to develop new techniques, to partner with individual laboratories in, in creating science that they can get money for, uh, for from, from grant proposals, to participate in grant proposals at, as co-investigators. There is that dual service and creative mode that the scientific directors and staff of the core facilities are currently empowered to do, and we need to protect that and strengthen that. Um, it's, it's, it's huge. It's a remarkably enriching, rich job if it doesn't become drudgery, right? And I think we can protect against that. Um, so we need to continue to hire and retain um, excellent staff. Um, and then just as important is the administrative staff. Um, so this is an area where we all rely on Holly and her colleagues for communications, for web hosting, for events management, all of that, for administration of the large center proposals that cross schools and colleges. They do an enormous amount, um, and that needs to be nurtured. And not to put too fine a point on it, we need more people. Um, because IBB is not shrinking, uh, and this, these demands are only growing. Um, and again, managing, incentivizing, I hate that word, um, nurturing that the administrative staff will be an important um, component. If I could propose one metric for IBB success, it would not be the landing of center grants. It would be the submitting of quality center proposals. Okay? Because when one puts together a multi-institutional or multi-investigator, multi-school, multi-college, large proposal, even if you don't get it, if it's in an important area, and you're not going to spend time doing it if it isn't important, probably, and if you do it well, that spins out all sorts of benefits. Right? It spins out individual interactions or small group interactions. It nucleates thinking. It promotes the kinds of science that tackle big problems and engineering. Remember, I use the word science to mean both. Okay? I don't care, okay? the, 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 the distinction. So we promote science and engineering of important problems in ways that get people together by putting these center grants together. So this would be in my view, a key metric for IBB success. How well do we do this? How, how many and how well um, are those center grants put together, those proposals? Um, culture is, is an important component for me um, in the sense that it's, it's sort of hard to define but really evident when you don't have a good culture. The IBB culture is amazing, right? And again, it's what attracted me here. Um, and so that is, this is simply a note. Let's nurture this as much as we can. Let's get as many vehicles as we can think of for people to get together without meeting fatigue. Um, we have to be creative about that. Uh, and uh, we need to empower the students. The best interactions, the best collaborations are driven by the students and the postdocs. So we need to empower them to get together. 
There's lots of stuff going on. I don't, I, I don't have time to go through the details of what's happening, but just know that that's an important um, uh, activity for me, an important goal. Um, I speak school chair. Uh, it's a new language. It's a, it's a, it's a language. Um, uh, and, and partnership with school chairs, plural, will be essential, is essential, and will continue to be essential with the success of IBB. Um, I would like, as director, to really partner intimately with school chairs on hiring. I've had the privilege of doing that as a school chair in chemistry. We've been able to compete for people that we would never have been able to compete with. Um, the, the hiring process often gets new resources into IBB from the point of view of new instrumentation that is better to put in a core than in an individual laboratory. But it goes, much, goes far beyond just the negotiating with candidates. Okay? The relationship of IBB and school chairs is one of, IBB is really here to support your mission as a school chair. It would be great to discuss that mission, to understand what your priorities are in research and development and workforce development and training. Uh, and IBB is primarily a service organization, um, and so partnership with school chairs is essential. There would be lots of conversations um, and on an ongoing basis uh, for those priorities. Let's see. Um, Okay, then there's a whole other world, development, tech transfer, um, and industry. So that world of IBB interaction um, is one that is, uh, boy, that's really terrible handwriting, uh, is one that is essential to long-term growth. So uh, I've talked with uh, Phil Spessart and others in development. There are real opportunities for IBB to get involved, I think, in a, in a more intensive way. Potential donors to Georgia Tech in, in, in interested in this area should come and see, spend some time in IBB. Um, IBB should be encouraged to reach out to potential donors uh, and to engage with them directly in partnership, of course, with the development arm. There's lots we can do. We should be looking to name. Every core facility should have a name on it, right? You want to ante up? Dig deep, right? We'll put your name on a core facility uh, for a certain amount of money. I mean, there's all sorts of naming opportunities, all sorts of opportunities to engage with students and trainees uh, of all kinds. Project Engages needs some more money. We would love to expand that program, or I would. Um, so from an outreach point of view, again, development is key. Okay? Tech Transfer, I've had some really interesting and lovely interactions with, uh, with the folks in Tech Transfer. It's getting better and better. They're hiring people. That's going to be an important area for IBB to play. Um, just for those of you who are not aware, Georgia Tech has had great success in IP development and spinning out companies in areas that are not the life sciences, right? Devices, software, and engineering of all kinds. We lag behind, given our strength, our research strength in biosciences and bioengineering, but it's a long-term game. Um, and so there's lots we can do with the folks that are already in place, Venture Lab and other organizations are already in place, that train is already leaving the station, and uh, it will be uh, a, a large part of, a significant part of the IBB director's job to sustain that. And I mentioned a little bit about industry. Um, I would like to get industry to come to campus for all sorts of reasons, training being among them. Right? We can help industry train their people, uh, and I think we can do that very well and make a little money uh, at it as, more importantly, build those connections. Um, industry can use our facilities. We need to work out some some kinks there, that's already been shown to work. Um, and my most valuable thing that I get out of interacting with industry, and we've done this for a long time, is knowing what they consider the important problems are. Right? That is golden information as a, as a research scientist and engineer. And these, are, these people are not fools. Right? They know what the real problems are. So getting them on campus, interacting with IBB investigators, um, to a greater extent, will be very important. Um, and lastly, um, I already mentioned Project Engages and Petite Scholars. Outreach uh, is a really important part of IBB, and, and I think it is done well and needs, needs more attention. And just lastly, remember that there are some big things potentially coming up in the next five to 10 years in terms of infrastructure. Uh, EBB2 and EBB3 need to be programmed. Um, I don't quite know what the planning is, but my sense is it hasn't projected, progressed very far. The IBB director, uh, I hope, would be involved in that since I'm sure there will be life science and engineering emphasis in both of those buildings. Um, and also the Technology Enterprise Park, TEP, 
Uh, there's lots of development that's going to go on there, and that's supposed to have a life science focus. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to be really excited to uh, help use that resource to, uh, to increase our footprint. Um, I think that's where I'll stop and, and kind of open it up since I'm running out of time. Uh, and um, I don't have any more quotes, so that's it for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, MG. It was really, really fantastic vision. Um, re regarding the resources, I, mean, I think it's maybe yeah, that's probably primary in everybody's mind. And it's a challenge for me to understand at Georgia Tech how we have the best stock market we ever had. We're bringing in more money than we ever have, and yet it seems like all the R IRIs are being cut in their budget. So how do you um, how do you square that? Uh, so I don't know. It might be actually quite useful for Steve Cross to or his successor to give a town hall on this every so often, right? To remind people of how the money works here. Um, and it's a little different at Georgia Tech in my, in my experience than other institutions. But in essence, um, I think you need, first thing you need to understand is that they really do support IBB and it's not like they could give money, more money, but they're just not because they're being mean, okay? There are obviously a lot of calls on the, the money. Um, the money usually, it mostly comes from tuition. I mean, you know, this is, that's where Georgia Tech makes most of its coin. Um, and uh, a small, for example, a small difference in the ratio of in-state to out-of-state students has a huge impact on the discretionary income of everybody at Georgia Tech. Because all the money funnels to a central place, right, all of our grants pay overhead, that overhead doesn't come back to us directly, right, it goes to the administration, which then portions it out in terms of priorities. Thus, the system is set up for Steve to have to balance all sorts of competing uh, insights. So the way you operate in that system is not uh, the squeaky wheel gets the grease um, because these are smart people and they have everybody's best interest in mind. It's making a good case for, for I hate the term, but return on investment for value. And IBB, if we can't make a really phenomenal case, Bob does this very, very well. Well, make an extraordinary case. What you invest in IBB redounds to the research reputation, faculty recruiting, student training, education, what our alumni say about us, what the rest of the world does with the tech ideas and all of that. If you can't make that case, you know, you got to go, go stick your head in the sand. I mean, it is an easy case to make. But it needs to be made very vigorously. Um, and even then, we're not going to get everything we ask for, right? There are a lot of other great stuff going on here and a finite amount of money. But IBB, you know, IBB is a good investment. I did, yeah. So bring, you know, so. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in addition to bringing program managers, industry reps, have you thought about bringing in state legislatures to almost a dog and pony show so they can see what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, quick story, true story. I was at University of Virginia, uh, start my academic career, and I asked that very question. Right? Why don't we, the, the legislators never visited the UVA campus, right? And the response, actual response I get was, well, Thomas Jefferson wouldn't have done that, okay? <laughs> You know, it was beneath, you know, beneath him, right? Um, so, no, right? You rob banks because that's where the money is, right? You, you court legislators because that's where the money is. But also, that's how you connect to larger swaths of, of, of society. So, absolutely. School chairs are called on occasionally. Um, and as EBB ambassadors, Todd and I and others have been called on to interact with groups of local legislators and state legislators that come through, I'd love to do more of that, and we need to work with Robert Knotts and the others to, to make that happen. I mean, I think there have been nice stories of, you know, senators uh, visiting campus in the past. I don't, I think it should happen more because um, we can put on a good show. Uh, great presentation. Uh, quick couple of questions. Um, piggybacking off his question, as, as you know, people really feel like there's a recession coming 
within the next year or two. No one knows the exact location. And you mentioned in your presentation about the, you know, how private institutions can raise capital and so on and so forth. What things do you think need to be done now in not only preparing for that inevitability, but the entrance of new actors that are well financed, you know, like for example, Harvard or whatever, you know, what things do you think we need to be doing now so that when these things inevitably happen, we are just way more prepared and we can maybe turn it into a, an advantage of sorts. Sure. Yeah, it's a great time to hire is when everybody else isn't hiring, right? Uh, so uh, IBB has a particular advantage with respect to many other parts of the campus in that IBB has an endowment. And so, of course, the long-term, the, the, the best hedge against economic variation is to build the endowment and to, and to use it wisely. So that is a long-term effort, um, and uh, I would look forward to working with development, as I mentioned, uh, in, in many ways to help build that. Uh, you know, let's look at, let's think about the advisory board and how that can impact. Let's reach out to other players. That's a long-term fix, right? Um, Short-term responses to what you say are very difficult, right? We very often have to make the best of a fluctuating situation. Uh, and so, you know, there it's, you know, what is the philosophy? The philosophy is, is uh, nurture good people. People are more important than anything else. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you save the equipment when you can. Um, but, you know, we're... Take it from me, uh, the, the fiscal variations you see here, and this is in no way going to make it easier, but the fiscal variations you see here are in general less, the delta is much less than at some of these other institutions that you named and, and, and other public institutions. The Georgia Tech administration does a pretty good job, and the state of Georgia, I think they should drop more money on us, but you know, in general, the support for higher education is not that variable. Um, so we'll write it out. Uh, you know, but again, we need to work hard to, to raise more money for the endowment, uh, you know, fellowships, all of that. We got a lot of work to do. But there's no quick fix. Um, we have an yeah. we have an online question. If you hold on one second, the online question is: Bob Naram and Bob Goldberg have created their own legacies in IBB. What will distinguish yours? Oh, um, so. I am, I don't know if I mentioned this, but my instinct is bottom up and not top down, okay? But if I had the chance, and of course, people who know me will know that I will vigorously campaign for scientific themes that I find exciting, uh, here's part of what, what, what they would be. If, so Bob Goldberg's legacy is in many respects, but I think most of us would, would attach the uh, subject of biomaterials and regenerative medicine. Uh, to Bob's legacy as a scientist here at Georgia Tech. Um, and so in that spirit, I will say that one aspect I'm very passionate about is the use of evolutionary techniques to create new things. So here at Georgia Tech, we have amazing people who study and use evolution from a variety of, of points of view, natural evolution, Darwinian evolution, evolution of molecules in a directed sense, theoretical aspects, genomic aspects, um, of uh, studying viral populations. All that stuff happens here, plus, of course, chemical aspects, the Center for Chemical Evolution. How did life uh, begin evolving? All of that is here. Uh, and I made a joke earlier, in the Deep South, right? We're, we're leading the league in evolution in the Deep South. That is remarkable, right? The one part that we're not doing yet as well as we could, and we should, is in using evolution to make new stuff. And here's my case for that. There are two ways now that are generally accepted to develop new ideas and concepts in science. One is hypothesis-driven, and we are all educated to value hypothesis-driven science. And the other is data-driven, right? Let's collect a whole bunch of data and let's extract from using analytics tools and good thinking and all of that, let's extract lessons that way. Nature does not pose hypotheses and does not collect data. Right? And yet nature makes things that we you know, will never be able to match. How does nature do that? Well, of course, by evolution, right? Nature has a mechanism to change things, to adapt to new situations, and kill off the things that don't work, right? If you want to make something new that has sophisticated properties, I mean make stuff, like stuff, you know, tabletops, right, stuff. If you want to make stuff, nature does that by evolving it. We don't know how to do that yet. 
We can evolve a protein, molecular evolution core can evolve an enzyme, even that's hard, right? Can evolve a binder, that's easy, a molecule that binds to something, but we have no idea how to evolve a material. Right? We have no idea how to evolve a complex system that is not a biological organism. Right? We can lead the universe in that. And so if I had, you know, I'm going to go out and as not an IBB director role, but let's try to raise a bunch of money to start an institute for functional evolution and really do that. That's one thing. Another thing is more that IBB can help shape um, is the connection between data analytics and the biological life sciences. Right? We do that reasonably well now but we don't do it nearly as well as we could given the people here who are expert in that. So connecting those folks together um, with some money, with some opportunities, IBB playing with ideas in ways that, that we haven't yet gotten together on, I think could be enormously powerful. Um, and so that's another area I would like to invest in. And a third one is one that I've talked to a number of people about already. Uh, and if you, t if you consider the area of cancer, and we're already doing some things in cancer, IBB has a wing devoted to this, but in general, in the area of immunotherapy, which is the most exciting recent development in cancer therapy, we are five or 10 years behind the curve. Um, however, we are leading the league in, in development of analytics for personalized medicine diagnostics of cancer. We have some amazing things going on here in the parallel sampling of in vivo information to diagnose complex diseases such as cancer. And I think we have an opportunity to marry those techniques and, and further development of that analytical power with immunotherapy, which we are already strong in, um, into something that is a much more powerful whole. So again, um, I'm a bottom-up person. I'm not going to impose these views, even if I had the power to do so, which I do not. I do hope, however, to persuade many of you, or at least enough of you, to uh, go in with me on, on summer, or, or perhaps all of these ideas. So that, from a scientific point of view, uh, is, is what I might hope for. Um, from an institutional point of view, again, uh, the Bobs have set up a, a really unique enterprise, which I find incredibly powerful. Um, and it will either go this way, or it will you know, go this way. Um, and if I can help it go this way, um, that, that's the legacy I would like. Yeah. One last quick question. I don't do quick questions. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, and you can tell I don't do quick answers. So. I, I, I'll do my best. Is it the charge of the IBB director to have kind of the, or, and to manage at a meta level what's happening with individual cores? I mean, the... I mean, the, it seems like we have a, a hybrid model when we bring new building and locations on board, like EBB, where you have faculty who are, and you know, a part of this exciting ideation phase of what core facilities would make it attractive for them to be there, without necessarily having to think through the long-term sustainability of those cores uh, and and who they benefit outside of the people who go. Right? It sounds like if EBB two and three come on board, presumably we would follow that same paradigm, you know, and there would be potentially some dilution of what's happening and what cores are located in different areas. Do, do you, again, is it, the, is it who's, whose responsibility is it to kind of maintain some coherence to our strategy with respect to cores that has been something that those of us who are in IBB have valued so much historically? I'm glad you asked the question because it gives me a chance to emphasize what I regard as the most important mission of the IBB director, and that's to keep the trains running. And by that I mean keep the core facilities at a high level, um, consistent and nurturing our growth. So should more buildings come online, in my view it would, should, be the IBB, it should be IBB's responsibility to manage that growth, get input from everybody, but it's got to be the IBB responsibility to to keep the trains running, right? Um, and, you know, we were involved in discussions. When EBB was being planned, it was not a given that those core facilities would go under IBB. Uh, and we had lots of discussions about that, and eventually the decision was made to, to do that. And I, I think that was exactly the right decision. I, don't, I can't imagine two separate, how that would really work smoothly, two separate loci, lo, loci of power, as it were, or responsibility in that area. So I think it's been successful. It's going to be more challenges as we grow, but those are challenges I think IBB should be meeting. Um, so, yeah, that's the most important thing.
Thank you for coming. Appreciate it.